Welcome back to Podcast Launchpad. I am Kelly. In my role as a podcast consultant and educator, I am constantly being asked to recommend a podcast hosting provider. In my 11 plus years of podcasting, I've hosted my four shows in five different places. Today, all of my shows are proudly hosted at Captivate.fm. And I'm thrilled to be chatting with the CEO and co-founder of Captivate, Mark Asquith also known as That British Podcast Guy. Mark has been a leader in the podcasting industry for 10 years. He's a co-founder of PodcastWebsites.com, Podcast Success Academy, Podcast Launch Accelerator, the host of multiple podcasts, and a keynote speaker at TEDx, Harvard University, entrepreneur, and major podcast conferences. Welcome, Mark. I'm so happy to have you here today. Well, that's very kind. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So I want to jump right in with something that I've heard you say several times. Even though I think Captivate is the best podcast hosting provider, I've heard you tell people that just about any podcast hosting provider is fine, you know, fine to go with. Honestly, I love that you don't automatically tell people that Captivate is the only podcast hosting provider that they should choose. Why do you say that? Why do you say that just about any hosting provider is fine? Just because I think that I've been in the industry for such a long time that I just want to see all ships rise. And that, that's always been my intent. And it's always been my approach. You know, when I got into podcasting a long, long time ago, I would attend conferences and a lot of the other hosting companies would be a little bit, you know, a little frosty with me. Um, it's ironic because they're all friends now. Um, right. and, and, and it's... The reason for that was that they, they were protecting their position. You know, they were protecting what they did. And I understand that. But from my, my side of things, it was very much, um, you know, it doesn't matter what, you in, what you're into. Like, you know, I, I play bass guitar and, and, I, and I play golf. And, and, and I've got two different types of bass. I've got a Fender Geddy Lee Jazz and I've got an Ernie Ball Music Man Stingray 4. And I've got some Ping Golf Clubs and some TaylorMade uh, Driver uh, and a 3 wood. And But guess what? Like the person that I play with, my co-founder Kieran, he's got some Strix and Irons, and he's got a, a a different set of woods, and he he doesn't play guitar. And Dave Jackson, who I've just done an interview with, he's a a fantastic podcast expert that, that has been in this for for such a long time. He plays guitar, and guess what? He's got a different guitar. Look at where all he's just as good. He's fat. He's actually far better. But he's he's got his thing, and it suits his need. It suits his requirements. So the you know if if you play Fender guitars. You don't tell people that Gibson guitars are bad. You just say, I like Fender. And that's the point with, with podcast hosting for me is that no one intentionally turns, turns up to do a bad job. It's just different things fit different people. And from, from my perspective, genuinely, like Captivate does not want to work with every podcaster. If we did, we would do a free plan. We don't do free plans. Mm -hmm. And we would probably do some sort of sign-up incentive like an Amazon voucher like some hosts do. But guess what? We don't because we don't want everyone. And yeah. the reason for that is that we know, we know the type of work that we do and who that will suit. And mm -hmm. no one's doing a bad job in hosting. They're just doing different jobs. So, you know, it, I would rather you start your podcast somewhere than not start it. And mm -hmm. at the point, you know, at the point that you think maybe I need another host, maybe you'll then look at Captivate in five years' time. Who knows? So it's it's more just a positive mindset, I think, than than bashing other people. I don't think you get anywhere doing that. Oh, true. I I love that. Yeah, you'd rather see people just get started. And there's so much analysis paralysis with new podcasters, you know, especially people who are just getting started. And then even later, you know, after you've picked all of your stuff, hearing what other people are using and then second guessing what you've already chosen, even, you know, starting with your mic and then your recording equipment and then the podcast hosting provider, just all of it's like, oh my God, I could be doing better. And there are just so many options. So yeah, just pick something and, and get started. But when it comes to picking a podcast hosting provider, are there some basic features that 
podcaster should be looking for? I feel that that there are two sets of 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 decisions that you've got to make. There's the there's the decisions around what do you genuinely need, and there's the decisions around are there some promises that the hosting company might struggle to fulfill. Mm-hmm. So the basics are, you know, the basics. Will it deliver you an RSS feed that you can put in all of the podcast directories? Well, yeah, that's that's it. Just at its most basic level, that is all it should do. Mm-hmm. And then does it give you analytics about your downloads? Okay, that's probably the next big thing. But then there are a host of other things. You know, there are things like we captivate the episode planning, the research links tools, the workflow tools to build your show notes for you, the marketing tools, the dynamic content insertion. And and, and so for me, it's very much about, you know, how, how, how are you going to build your show? You know, if you've got a narrative story-based podcast, then you are going to want something that's probably going to give you research tools and the ability to ideate and so on and so forth. If you're doing a solo podcast, you could probably do that on paper. Mm-hmm. That's all right. You know, right. It, you might find it easier to do it in your hosting platform and save time that way. But I would rather you just got started than worry about whether you do need that or not. Yeah. And I, I, I feel that, you know, there are some, some some real fundamentals. You know, the interface has to be easy to use. You've got to be able to use it on every device. You've got to have personal support that doesn't make you feel silly. One of the big reasons I started Captivate was that um, there were a lot of people in the industry that were sort of gatekeeping it and sort of saying, well, if you, you know, if someone asks a question about podcasting, oh, look at them, they don't know what they're talking about because, you know, we are the experts. And I thought, well, of course, how the heck, if, if I, if my kid, if my little girl comes up to me and she's like, dad, how do I start a podcast? I'm not just going to go, ha ha, look at me. I'm the expert. You're an idiot. I'm like, you're my, you're my kid. I'm going to teach you. And it's, I, 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 I didn't like how that was being approached. So support, really personal support, I think is very important. Um, but then there's the things that you've got to watch for. Now, it's not to say that anyone is doing a bad job. It's just to say that there are some assumptions in podcasting and there are some things that podcasters want to hear that um, are very difficult to fulfill. Mm. So there are some hosting companies out there that will promise to make you money. Uh, yeah. They can. They, they, no. they can. they can. You know, now, do we pro- provide monetization tools? Yes, you can sell memberships. Yes, you can sell bonus and exclusive content. Yes, you can accept. Yes, we'll be rolling out things like ad marketplaces and so on because that's just the way of the industry. But, <laughs> you know, you can't make... If, if you go to a hosting company that says, we will activate you for advertising regardless of your size, mm-hmm. and then you make 13 cents per month because you don't have an audience, that, you know, did you put your trust in the right place? Because you're going you're gonna to sacrifice a lot of the toolkit because they're so focused on their business model being advertising. Right. And, and, and it is, it, it's difficult because you... You can only make money through growth and you can only grow through either saving time or saving money. That is it. Mm-hmm. The more time you have, the more you can put into growing and marketing. The more money you save, the more you can invest in, guess what? Marketing. Right. So it becomes this catch-22. And, that, and that's, that's really the Captivate mission. I said this when we first launched with Kieran. I said, look, we're going to be growth focused. That's the tagline. Um, but when someone says, what's the mission? Why are you different? You know, it's a mindset. It's it's mm-hmm. the mindset. It's you know we we will only build tools that will save you time, save you money, or make you money. And I mean that genuinely. Not not we're not promising to make you advertising books. We're saying that it, here's a way to sell your content for a price that you determine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a it's just a mindset. I think, and, that, and that's the key difference. I think we captivate. Yeah, and I love that, and. I am personally leery of the podcast hosting providers that focus on the ad revenue because I would want total control over the ads that can come into my episodes. And so I am really wary of the ones that are like, here, we'll get you these ads, but you may not have control over what ads those are. And then they're not necessarily gatekeeping what ads are coming on to your show. You know, they may not be a fit. 
because I've I've heard of some fellow podcasters who've been like, oh my God, I, I got this ad on my show and it totally you know, didn't match what my show was about. And I don't want that happening. Yeah, I get that. I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, I've got sort of two feet in podcasting, one in the consumer facing software as a service, helping independent creators. And we help tens of thousands of people like you and I, you know, and that's a big concern. But the other, the other side of my job, my day today is that, you know, we're part of Global, which is the biggest media company in the UK. Um, and we've got a, a, a big stake out in the US as well. You know, we, we've, we've got podcasts on Captivate that have tens of millions of downloads per month. Yeah. And the, 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 the beauty of having both feet on different sides of the podcasting scales is that um, what you're talking about there, which is brand safety, is very important regardless of your size. And I think what, you know, the, the, the responsible way to do programmatic advertisement, you know, because there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, a programmatic marketplace. There's nothing wrong with programmatic um, DAI and DCI and, and the ability to um, offer your inventory, your supply up to a demand side partner that, right. that can fill that inventory. There's nothing wrong with that. But it does need a layer of brand safety, which is, you know, let's not make, let's make sure that we aren't advertising alcohol on right. the Alcoholics Anonymous podcast, you know, and it, it's at a, a real base level. Right. And, but, but that can affect us. It can affect us, the indie podcaster. We talk about one thing and we get an advertiser that's not aligned with what we believe. And it is the, 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 the elements of brand safety are becoming more and more important. And that's why a lot of the time, like programmatic advertising, um, so when you see a lot of hosting companies saying, we will open up our ad marketplace, that's programmatic advertising. So what that means is, that's essentially um, what is called spot advertising, where you'll, you know, say you've got a 30 minute episode and, and, and you'll insert a spot, an advertising spot at minute 15. That, that, that inventory, that supply, which is your episode, goes off to a DSP, which is a demand, um, demand side uh, provider. And what it will do is it will say, right, what are the categories of podcasts that this is in? And let's match some ads to it. Now, the problem with that is that, um, because advertising and marketing at that level is all about brand positioning, it's very rarely direct response these days. It sometimes still is in podcasting. Mm -hmm. But what that means is that it's all about brand recall. So mm -hmm. brand recall requires a massive brand saturation so that that brand can be recalled. Right. And that requires big numbers. You yeah. know, So the problem is you go to a hosting company that will say, we'll open up our ad marketplace to you and you've got 100 downloads an episode. That's pretty cool. You know, That's four classrooms full of people. Mm -hmm. but they're paying 30 bucks per thousand right. impressions, that thousand downloads, 30 times that that ad is heard. Yeah. Or are you going to get three bucks off it? Right. So it's, this, this is where this, this, um, the gap in promises that I talked about earlier, you know, it's, I could put a, a Captivate ad marketplace together within probably like a week mm -hmm. and I could put it in the feature list and I could say, we can, we will open up our ad network to you and people would flock to it. They would. Mm -hmm. But guess what? In a month's time, they're like, why have, why have I only got three books, Mark? Well, right. sorry. Here are the genuine economics of that. So yeah. you've got to you've got to really think about that. And it's it's funny because rightly so, not many podcasters have got that foot in that level of brand marketing like I have because of my job. Yeah. They don't see the the work that goes into matching brands with certain types of show. And they don't see the programmatic elements to it because they don't need to. All they see is someone, some guru has told me, you know, that on a 97 bucks a month course or whatever it is, some guru has told me that I can, you know, create a show and build an audience, then monetize it. And it sounds like it's just, well, one step and then the next step and then the right. next step. And it's not, you know, yeah. I could, I could easily create a business and I could create the business and I could build the business and I could make money from the business. But those three steps take 10 years. Yeah. And it's, that's the deal you know that's like anything worth building takes time so yeah a lot to unpack there but that's i think a lot of the misconception in podcasting right now yeah i agree a, a massive misconception and that when people think of monetiz monetizing a podcast i think they automatically think of sponsorships or ads when there are really other ways you could monetize like selling your own services i personally think that that's a, a quote easier way to monetize than trying to jump right into sponsorships or ads because of the numbers 
you know, you need a certain number of downloads to be able to do the sponsorships and ads. While with selling your own services, you could start doing that right away, quote, right away. You know, I would wait a little bit until you have an audience that really cares about you. But, you know, you don't have to wait for a certain number of downloads to promote yourself. I would say that I see a lot of success with smaller shows with direct selling um, where they might only have like 100 downloads per episode, but they do manage to sell good quality fixed price sponsorships to people within their niche. I know a, a few people that make six figures a year off, off three figure downloads per episode, you know, mm. because, but that's, that's not the norm. That is, it's, it's, a, it's a tight niche. It's someone that's good at business development. It's someone that has built relationships over the last few years within brands that are willing to sponsor this particular niche. Mm. Um, and I, I would say the easiest way to get started with monetiz monetization, I would do this from before day one, genuinely, these days. I think it's changed. I would do, um, I, I would consider like memberships and tipping. Like we do that with mm. Captivate. You can sell a membership and recurring revenue subscription. Or the easiest way is just turn on tipping, like go into Captivate and turn on the ability to accept tips. Um, and, and, and yeah, you might not get many, mm -hmm. but, you may as well have it on from the point of putting your trailer out than not. Right. True. You know? True. And that's a new feature, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's something that um, we nearly rolled it out last year. And then we did some other bits. Um, and then we put it out this year. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's something that I, re I really like that idea because I, for me, it's about diversity, right? If, if you, again, I, you know, I work on, on, on some big podcasts. And each one of those podcasts has a diverse team monetization. And it's like, it's like any business. If I, if I have a pile of eggs just in one basket and that basket just blows up, the eggs are gone and the revenue is gone. You know, could I direct sell sponsorship? Yes, I could. Could I sell my products? Yes, I could. Could I sell content as a membership? Yes, I could. Could I get tips? Yes, I could. Could I do live tapings? Yes. Could I do webinars? Yes. Could I so it's, it's diversity in different revenue streams, I think is important for a podcast. And we see it. We're starting to see it a lot more at like, um, I was on a call earlier with um, Tom from the podcast show in London. So it's a huge, huge event um, on par with podcast movement in the US. It's an absolutely huge show. And what it does is it straddles the line between um, industry talent. So like some of the huge creators and the big publishers and the big brands and the creators you know, the people that, are, that we typically think of as podcasters and, 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 and every type of person have, attends this show. And one of their big, big revenue streams is that they will put on live tapings of people's favorite shows. So I've got, I, there's a show I love called Rock on Tours uh, with Gary Kemp from Spandau Valley and a guy called Guy Pratt. He's a bass player. Oh, wow. Um, and he did, uh, I think his most famous song that will, most people will know is Like a Prayer, the Madonna song. He was the bass yeah. player in that. Um, and, they did just do a live taping, 300 people sells out. Wow. But we can do that. You know, we, we can do a live taping like this, like you and I are doing virtually. It doesn't have to be some. So I think the point that I'm getting at is diversity monetization is really, really, really important. It's not, it's not something many people think about because um, they often do think they need big numbers to make any money and it's not you need big numbers to make a certain type of money but you can yeah. make a lot of other types of money without that mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah i have a question backing up to features of podcast hosting providers as far as you know do any of them charge to transfer your podcasts to them because you know i'm not familiar with all of them but they hmm. say transfer your podcast for free. And oh, yeah, that's, I think that's me, mainly. That seems, you know, like a, a no-brainer. Mm. Yeah, it does. I think well, generally speaking with that one, that's usually because there's a perception from people that have never done it before that you might have to pay. Um, it, it's like anything. It's, it's, it's almost like a plumber putting on his van, get a free estimate or a free yeah. quote. Like, you know, so it's, yeah. I think it's more about um, uh, overcoming a perceived objection okay. early on. In the, in the, in the sales pages. Yeah. Okay. It, I don't know anyone that does charge for it. I know some people would charge, like, I don't think anyone does this anymore because it's really naughty, but I don't, there were some hosting companies that would charge you um, to keep your old feed up as a redirect 
to your new host, um, which was really naughty. Like we saw that a few years ago. And um, so what was happening was you put the, as you know, you put the redirect from your old hosting company's RSS feed to your new hosting company's RSS feed. And that tells Apple and Spotify and wherever else that your feed has moved. Right. Eventually they recognize that and they say, okay, let's stop sending, let's stop looking at the old one. We'll just look at the new one forever. But in that interim period, mm. there were some companies that would either cutting that connection off or they were charging to keep it alive, which is really naughty. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, that's bad business, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Thank you for that. Cause I've told, you know, clients and students, as far as I know, no one charges, but if you ever see a podcast hosting provider that charges to transfer, run away from them because nobody's yeah, exactly. be doing that. <laughs> it's easy. You give them the RSS feed and <laughs> whammo. So. Okay. All right. Let's talk some specifics about Captivate. And I'd love to share a few things that, that I love about Captivate. And then I want to hear from you. And you have already shared some things. So I, as I said, I've got this show, my old show, Marketing Chat Podcast, Geek Girl Soup, and a private podcast there. And, and I do love that, that you can have multiple shows hosted on one account, you know, as opposed to logging out, logging into another, and it's all under one payment. Just fabulous. I love being, and this sounds sort of dippy, but this is key to me. Being able to do the settings for the audio player just once and then copying it, you know, for each episode and then pasting it right into my website at another hosting provider, I had to redo the settings every time I went in to copy and paste the code. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. That's a little shaky. Yes, totally. It was so frustrating. And it's like, am I doing something wrong? And I was not. I was not. Yeah. I love the analytics that Captivate. I like being able to add a transcript to the audio player. Not that I've done that the whole time, but I finally started doing that as Descript has improved their transcripts. <laughs> and so now I have very few changes I have to make to it. Uh, I love adding the blocks in the show notes so I don't have to copy and paste my footer every time. Uh, there's just so much to love, and I don't even use every feature that Captivate offers. So can you share a few of your favorite features and some of the new ones y'all have recently rolled out? Absolutely. Most of these are just because I'm lazy as well. <laughs> <laughs> they literally mostly come from me being lazy. Um, but, you know, that is genuinely true. But, but it, it, a lot of it comes from years of, of being frustrated by being lazy as a podcaster and thinking, why is this just, why is this just not easier? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what they always say, solve your own problem, don't they? But yeah. I, um, I'm a huge fan. The, the things I probably use most, so I've got... Um, I've got the dynamic show notes set up really nicely for my shows. Um, the, the ones that I, I use particularly often are the guest booking and interview management. So I book all my interviews through that. And the reason for that is that, say, if you came on the show, it would get me all of your info. And then there's just a block for you in the show notes and it outputs your info, which is, is very, very powerful. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is um, really the episode planning and research links. So I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm a huge believer in, you know, planning your podcast episodes and, and, and at least doing some cursory top level planning. Um, so we, we've got an episode planning tool where you can just drop all your ideas into it, plan your production notes, plan your show notes. Um, but also we've got a Chrome applet, a Chrome plugin that will allow you anytime you're browsing the web and you see a link that's pertinent to your episodes, you just clip it with that little snippet and it'll send it into Captivate. And then what happens is you, um, so I do like a Star Wars news podcast. So what I, what I do is well, we discuss the news. So I'll plan the episode out and I'll, you know, I'll, throughout the week, I'll be snipping these news stories and sending them to Captivate. And then at the end of the week, I'll plan the episode and I just attach each link to the episode in about two minutes. And all it does is it, it will, it does a number of things. It generates me some production notes so I can read the links. It will also then in my show notes, it will put all the links as a bullet point with the nice anchor text. And so it builds these massive show notes out for you, which is really good. Um, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge, huge fan of that one. Okay. The other thing that I use a lot is um, the dynamic content 
uh, insertion engine, which is called Amy um, Audio yeah. Yeah. Monetization Insertion Engine. I use that for like timely messages, seasonal messages for inserting little adverts for things, uh, you know, like whatever the tipping tool or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I use that, but I use that in particular, I'm a big fan of using that in tandem with the short links function that we've got. Mm. So you can attach uh, like bitly style short to your audio and that yeah. will render out in your show notes and so on. So it's, uh, yeah, very, very powerful stuff. All about saving time and money. Absolutely. And oh my gosh, I love your description of how to use the episode planning tool. I haven't done that yet. And now I'm going to go in and try it. And I did not know about the Chrome, uh, you call it applet or extension. Oh yeah, it's so good. It's a clo- oh, uh, Chrome extension. Okay. And what you do is you... You, you 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 click it and then you say select a podcast. So what what podcast do I want to save this link to? Um, and then you can it it will pull a label out and some notes for you, and you can just amend them. And then it will just it will you can attach those links then to episodes, and it just saves you so much time. It's so good. Oh my gosh! All right, that sounds amazing. I I will try that. I haven't tried it yet because honestly, I love my Apple Notes. You know, the, yeah. the, I don't know if you're an Apple or, or a PC mm-hmm. guy, but I tend to do it all just in Apple Notes and then I copy and paste into the show notes section. But that sounds amazing. So I'm I would, I would definitely look at that. Okay. I, I think, I think you will save a lot of time. I'm, I was the same, I used to use like Notion or Evernote or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of this is you can, you, you, you plan your episodes. So like I just, I just had Dave Jackson on my show like an hour ago. So I planned all the notes out. I'd attached Dave's booking to yeah. that episode idea. So that will bring in all his bio, his picture and everything into the show notes, okay. all of his links. And then I had some links to like his podcasts and the school of podcasting. Yeah. And I attached those links. So then the show notes will be like a thousand words based wow. on that. And it's, yeah. and then all I do is um, when I've recorded the episode, I will just click convert to episode and all those blocks you put in, yeah. they will just convert all that information into my episode and it's, it's done. Wow. Okay. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. And I will have done it by the time this comes out. So I'll put in the show notes how it went. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I think it'll save you some time. And I, I, it's actually Thank quite you. fun to use it if you're, if you're a bit of a geek like me as well. Yes, yes. I I do love technology. So and honestly, I haven't used the guest scheduling thing, even though that looks fabulous. And I've recommended it to people who don't already have another scheduling system going. Mm. And I haven't used it because I use my honeybook system, but yeah, maybe I will try this too. I think it's one of those we, we we built it for people that um you know I wouldn't say move if 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 you've already got it all set up because there is there obviously there's inevitably set up but I wanted it to be um I really wanted it to be useful for those people that are just starting out and you know like someone might think I've got to start an interview podcast and that's what I want to do mm-hmm. I didn't want them to think well I'm not going to start that because I can't be bothered setting up a scheduler right you know I'd rather they got podcasting so there is a lot of that thought that goes into captivate as well you know the yeah. The, the, you know, how can we just shave a little bit of the friction off for people? That's excellent. I, I just love that, that, yeah, you, you've set up something here to try to make podcasting as easy as possible, not just for new podcasters, but for people who have been around as mm. well. So. Yeah. We do get a lot of people that have, uh, you know, that have, have been around for a little while and they're sort of, you, 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 I'll chat to them at events and say, I look between you and me, you know, you've saved me a, 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 like a thousand hours over the last two years. Oh, Why no. the heck didn't I move sooner? So that, mm-hmm. that's always really nice to see that. Um, for me, it's it, it, like, if it can help them create better shows, mm-hmm. you know, if it can help them create better content, then that's good because they keep podcasting. We all do well. So it's, that's the main thing. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, and thank you for doing that because <laughs> I certainly love Captivate. Well, so, thank you. Let's talk for a few minutes about websites for podcasts. Mm. Now, I know that podcastwebsites.com, you're no longer taking new clients, but you can certainly talk about what podcasters need on their websites. So do you still recommend WordPress 
for podcast websites? Um, it's a difficult one because I, I, you don't always need such a comprehensive site. Um, it, it's there are other tools that will give you like a one page. Like Captivate has inbuilt one page websites that I actually use right. them for two of my shows. So my, my main show, the Podcast Accelerator, I, I moved. I actually moved that show off my main WordPress personal brand website just to just to the Captivate site. Oh, um, wow. And that's free. It's inbuilt. It takes like five minutes to set up. Um, but but I think the things you've got to think about uh, are. You know, is this podcast the product or is it, is, you know, is this podcast website only there to show the podcast? Because if it is, just use the thing that's built into your hosting company. Yeah. But if you are, like if you're a business, like Captivate would not just use the Captivate website. It would need a Captivate branded, in-depth, full resource fueled website like it has. Right. Because it's not just about a podcast it's about a platform and a service and so if i'm a personal brand and i'm selling something or if i'm an entrepreneur if i'm a business person and a podcast is part of what i do or if it's part of my content marketing and it's actually a channel that i use for marketing then you probably should use something like wordpress and but then if you're in that position you've probably already got something like wordpress because right. of the fact that you're doing other stuff so for me if you're just doing a podcast you know you only need a few different things on there you need the ability for people to get a hold of your podcast you need a people uh, the ability to put your trailer on there clearly. You need the ability for it to put uh, put the latest episodes on and have some great SEO friendly work on there. Uh, your hosting company should have a decent version of that by twenty twenty three. Yeah. Um, and, and and so I, I would say don't worry too much about things like WordPress. Like I suppose the litmus test is you know if you're asking what WordPress is, you probably don't need WordPress. Right. You know, it, you you would be using that for something else. Yeah. Um, it's a very so that, that's robust what platform, but it can be, huge, if you're yeah. doing it yourself, it can be overwhelming if you don't really know what you're doing with all the plugins yeah. that are needed and having to make updates and everything. Oh, it's, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's why we created podcast websites back in 2014. You know, my background was agency work and building tech. Yeah. Um, and th th there weren't any good website options for podcasters until the hosting company stepped their game up and there were a few others came out of the woodwork. Right. Um, but there, there was nothing useful yeah. in the hosting space that would give you a decent website. Yeah, they had web pages, but they weren't oh, very nice. God, they were. Um, gosh, weren't they? So the, the, <laughs> the, they really were. But the, yes. um, so when we created podcast websites, it was like, look, actually WordPress is the best option, but we're going to give you a service as, um, it was almost like a productized service, you know, don't worry about, you know, going to an agency and getting quoted 10 grand to try and figure out bloody WordPress. We'll do it for, for X amount per month and we'll just be your partner for it. And that was, that's why we don't take on new clients with that one, because actually I just genuinely don't think podcasters need to start with WordPress mm -hmm. when they are starting out, if they're MVP in it, like the people that are on podcast websites now, by and large have built their shows into businesses or built their shows into other things that need other pages. Right. But if I'm starting a Star Wars podcast in my bedroom, I ain't, I, don't, I shouldn't be worrying about that, you know? Right. That's true. Yeah. And if you are like my clients are on the whole entrepreneurs starting a web, uh, starting a podcast as a marketing tool for their business. And what I tend to recommend for them is that they put the podcast on their business websites. Yeah, because absolutely. And you can support, you want the SEO from the podcast on your website so that you're attracting yeah. those people to your website as opposed to having the podcast as a separate website where your business website isn't benefiting from that SEO. Yeah, and I think it's not just the SEO. I mean, that's a big part of it, but I think it's also the user journey. You know, you've yes. got more ability to... to customize that user journey on a more custom WordPress site or an, a, a, another platform. I, I, I think Absolutely. you have, um, you know, you'll have designed your marketing flow, your funnels, you'll have de designed the, 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 the way that you want users to experience a website. And you, if it's not on a, just a podcast website, you can say, well, look, the, the next step after you've been on this podcast episode page is actually go and do this other thing as opposed yeah. to just go and listen to another episode or whatever. Um, 
So yeah, the, I think the needs are very, very different for that. And anyone that's in the kind of business space, they will have a website already. So I, I fully agree that should be should be added to that website. Absolutely, it's, it's silly to fragment it. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, so I do things a little bit backward on this show usually, and ask about your background last. <laughs> so you were not always in podcasting. Uh, or in entrepreneurship. I love how you jumped into entrepreneurship when you were 23 after nearly losing your soul at three corporate jobs, even though the last one, the last corporate job lasted only one day, right? <laughs> oh, barely even a day. I think it was like two hours. <laughs> oh my game. gosh. So you arrived oh, and yes. then walked off? Pretty much. I was like, this is crap. What am I doing here? What a waste oh of time. God. I totally hear you. I, honestly, I've never had a full-time job. I started out as a marketing consultant and, and my first two gigs, almost full-time because the clients wanted me on site. And, and that was soul crushing because it's like, I can do this from home. I mean, there wasn't like working online at that point, really, but I, I could have been doing the work at home, you know, go into their site, do research, talk to people, but then actually write my reports and things from home. And they were like, here's your desk. You work here. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I get that. It was, it was uh, I think it's a lot of those, those decisions that end up pushing you away from it. If you just like, I've got a massive ADHD brain. I, I ain't focused on anything for you know, more than my brain wants me to be. And that might be five hours, it might be 10 hours, or it might be four seconds. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, it just didn't, that format just did not work for me. I need to be able to think differently. And it, it yeah, that it never, it just never fit. Yeah, totally hear you. And so you got into podcasting in 2013 when you started Two Shots to the Head, a podcast about DC Comics. Is that right? Yes, yeah, it was uh, a big DC Comics relaunch. I'm into, you can see I've got a Batwing there and there's a Superman painting down there. I'm, I'm big into uh, DC Comics and, and Star Wars and such. And it's, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a gateway drug into it, really. The ability to just talk about the thing that you like. Um, and yeah, it was quite fascinating to just, you know, just get recording something that people actually weirdly listen to. Yeah. And that's something I love about podcasting is that really there aren't any gatekeepers. It is such a democratic medium. And so earlier in our conversation, when you were talking about people in podcasting acting as gatekeepers, at least earlier on, you know, years ago, sort of denigrating or mocking people who didn't know anything about podcasting that, I mean, that really makes me sad. And, and I hear you, you know, I, back in the day, it, it pissed me off when people were like, ha ha, you don't, or that person doesn't know anything. It's like, well, you didn't know anything either when you first started out. I'm not you, you, you know, them, you, but this medium is, is so democratic and you can, anyone can start a podcast. And that's something that I love about it. That's what really got me interested in it. I mean, starting in 2013, um, did the show in 2013, 2014. I was starting to want to segue out of my agency business and get rid of that and, and, and move into something else. And I didn't know that was going to be software, even though we built software, we built, you know, stuff for people. I didn't know that I was going to build a startup and do all that kind of stuff. Um, so for me, it was, it was very much a, um, it, it was very much a, a community thing. So I went out to NMX, uh, New Media Expo in Vegas, a long, long time ago. That's where I met a lot of people that are now good friends, Dave Jackson, Rob Walsh, uh, people like Todd, Elsie, and Jess, uh, Ramona, John Oaks. It's just, I mean, a thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I think, what got me really fascinated by working in podcasting. So a lot of people say, oh, you, you're a podcaster. I was in the pub the other night, I, you know, went up to the, 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 the local near me, The Fiend, and it was, you know, the the the, the barmaid page who I'm good friends with and, and I was sat there having a drink on my own. She was like, so why should I listen to your podcast? I was like, I don't really, that's like, I do do podcasts, but I'm more, I work in podcasting. Like that's where I, I'm, my living comes from building stuff for podcasting. Yeah. 
I have podcasts and I would have those podcasts even if I didn't work in podcasting. Right. So I, whilst I'm a podcaster, it was, it was that conference that got me interested in working in podcasting mm -hmm. because um, it was a great community spirit. I really enjoyed the community element of it. Everyone wanted to see other people succeed. Yes. And, but also, like no one was doing startup thinking or marketing thinking in the space they were all just like oh here's what you can technically do with an rss feed and i thought that's pretty boring which is cool and like i know about it and i'm right. i'm i'm thankful that they exist yeah and and i respect the journey but like that ain't no one's gonna buy that who's gonna want to spend money on that right um so i just thought it was an interesting place to be it was an interesting way to um Almost experiment. Like I've done so many conferences, pretty much every conference uh, from 2015 to COVID. Mm -hmm. I did every, and I mean everything from, you know, the, the, the 5,000 person conferences to flying into Philly to do a 30 person conference. I've done mm -hmm. them all. And it was always the same. It was, you know, can I, can I go and, and see people wanting to start the thing that they want to start? And, and, it almost support the open nature of it so that, you know, if I, you know, look at Lou Hastings out there doing his podcast about fishing, you know, mm, yeah. look at yeah. Carmen and, 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 and Raf doing the serve podcast. And these are all people that just do it because they bloody love doing it. And, and, yeah. and like, for me, it was just, my job just needs to be help them do it. Um, and it happened to be through software. So I think that, that democracy in podcasting is so attractive because of that. And I think it's, it's one of those, um, you know, I, it's one of those mediums that's turned into a medium. I see, you know, like I said earlier, I've got a foot in each side of podcasting. Now podcasting has become media. It has become about IP. It has become about big brand books. And I, I work on those shows. I work on, you know, launching the news agent with global, which is, you know, tens of millions of downloads and, and, and the biggest show in the UK. Yeah. There's not really that much difference between that and, 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 and what the indie producers doing in their bedroom. It's just economies of scale when it comes to marketing and, and content. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know, I, with, with, the, with enough time and patience, I can achieve the same as anyone. And, you know, look at the, a great example of this would be someone like Jordan Harbinger. You know, he, he, mm -hmm. he, he left the art of charm and he started with nothing again. And he's built it up through solid marketing, through solid planning, great content. And he's, you know, he's a fantastic interviewer. And he's the most, one of the most astute marketing minds in podcasting. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's, we can all do that. He didn't yeah. come from a marketing background. And that's what fascinates me. It's, uh, yeah, it, it does. It, it still, even to this day, 10 years in, it still amazes me. True. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful. And I love hearing your passion about it and, and why you decided to do it and still do it. So what would your closing advice be to someone who is hesitating to start a podcast because they think the industry is saturated? Well, so we're in a world now, I'm, I'm living in 2023 where the biggest movie on the planet is about a doll from the 60s, 70s and 80s. And, about the, and then the second biggest is about the guy that was largely responsible for the atomic bomb. Right. And all those movies have been created and marketed and the Barbie is going to make a probably a billion dollars and Oppenheimer is probably not going to be far behind. And, you know, would Christopher Nolan have made Oppenheimer even though the billions of other films out there, some, you know, what, why would he still make the film? And it's because there's always stories to tell. There's always different perspectives to have. There's always, avenues that are unexplored. There's always a, a desire to want more information and more entertainment and more fun and more learning. And anything that you can get from any media, I can get the same from books, from videos. I can get the same from movies, TV shows, from podcasts. The, the, the podcasting, if you look at the grand scheme of media, right, what do you have? You've got YouTube, and this is just in video. In fact, let's just look at video, right? So forget books, forget blogs, forget audio books, forget any of that stuff, right? You've got YouTube, Netflix and all the streaming services. You've got yeah. network TV and you've got movies at the big at the, on the big screen. Mm -hmm. That's just four or five ways of consuming big video media. But every one of those channels is still creating content. 
podcasting is the bottom of the saturation pile. You know, would I not create a YouTube channel because it's too busy? No, of course I would. Would I not write a new book because it's too busy? No, of course I would. Would I not write a new article on Medium or my own blog because it was too busy? No, of course. So, and that's the thing with podcasting. I think it's just become trendy. So a lot of people are, you know, it's cool to bash the trendy things after they've been trendy for a little bit because it's trendy to not like the trendy things after a while. Right. You become the outlier. You know, it's, stu it's stupid. Yeah. Um, and I think that's all it is. It's just, you know, 4 million podcasts. What's that against 50, 60 million YouTube channels, if not more? Right, and right. How and many, 600 how many million blogs. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, I, I don't even, you know, I'm going to Google it now. How many movies, how many movies are there? You said, oh my God. Yeah, right. no idea. Yeah. There, there's 1 billion DVDs alone. Oh my gosh. According to Senate Club, and 5 wow. million actual movies have been made, apparently. Wow. In, tw in 2017, 12,000 movies, just movies. Wow. Not counting TV shows or streaming. Right. So, I mean, would, would you, why would you not? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you have your own unique voice, your own unique perspective. And if, if you're sharing, let's say, an informational podcast, what someone heard from someone else may not have stuck. And when they hear it from you, it will stick. Oh, well, that's right. We, so we all say things, things in, the different, in our own different ways, like as, as you absolutely rightly pointed out. I was, again, I was talking to Dave Jackson a, a second ago, and he was just saying that he and uh, Daniel J. Lewis cover a lot of the same content, but he's had people come up to him and say, how the heck can you listen to Dan? And Dan's had people come up to him and say, how the heck can you listen to Dave? Because one's <laughs> very factual, one's a little bit like me, a little bit fluffy, and it get, gets a bit wild and digresses a lot. And yeah. it's about delivering it in your own voice. So there's a, you're right, there's a lot of perspective that goes into creating a podcast episode. And that, that's such a unique thing. And, 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 and just to kind of cap that off, the, the, the way that podcasting is narrowcasted ideally down an RSS feed, yeah, it's not broadcasted out across radio. It's narrowcasted directly through a decision-making process via an RSS feed into an app into someone's ear. Mm -hmm. They choose the people they listen to. It's not broadcast where you've only got five or six different options back in the day. Right. They choose from this, this, this whole gamut of people that are saying the same things in different ways. And if they choose you, they're there. They, yes, they're there for what you're saying, but they're more there for you and how you say it. And I think that's important to understand. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they have chosen you. So put yourself out there so that they can choose you. They're looking for you. <laughs> they are. They are indeed. Hello. All right. Where would you like to send listeners to get more information about you and your services? Oh, I think probably just Twitter's a good one for now, or X or whatever it's called these days. Probably just at Mr. Asquith. Um, but okay. if you want more of this, this, this kind of this kind of chat, it's probably the podcast accelerator, which uh, is just at Mark dot Live, which is the podcast website for that. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Mark. This has been so much fun, and I appreciate all the wonderful information that you have shared. Oh, my sincerest pleasure, yeah, and thank you for all you do. Thank you for all of your support, and yeah, I'm always around to help, and, and yeah, really appreciate everything you're doing. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. Be sure to follow this show so you don't miss a single episode, and I will see you next time on Podcast Launchpad. <laughs>